congratulations, you just beat Resident Evil 7. The credits are rolling, and other than trying the game in VR after seeing a video about it on the internet, you've experienced all there is to the game, right? Wrong, because you've just unlocked Madhouse difficulty, and it's much more than just a difficulty bump. It changes the game and plays with your expectations in some pretty cool ways. I can't resist a premise like that, so let's find out how different Madhouse really is. By the way, I am going to talk openly about the first section of the game up until you leave the main house, so if you don't want to hear any spoilers or you want to experience Madhouse Blind, pause this video, subscribe so you don't forget, play the game, and then come back and watch. Let's do this. The first and most important difference you'll notice is when you get to your first save. Saves in Madhouse are limited, just like in the original Resident Evil, except instead of finding ink ribbons, you appropriately use cassette tapes. You'll always find several tapes next to every save, along with some scattered around the estate. But even with this relatively generous supply, you're still forced to save more sparingly than you did in normal mode. Auto saves are less frequent, but not gone completely. They will still happen in certain story moments to save you the frustration of having to watch unskippable cutscenes over and over again. Edith, it's good. Okay, fine. Your first real challenge comes from the Mia Chainsaw fight, which is significantly harder. It only takes two hits to kill you, and even worse, Mia has a much larger health pool. With only 27 bullets, every shot counts. I frequently found myself running out of ammo and having to switch to the hatchet, which, against the chainsaw, well... I had to do this fight eight times. Okay. Fine. It's a brutal opener, but the fight is important because it teaches you two things that will help you survive Madhouse. Dodging enemies, and nailing those headshots. After the dinner scene, you have to avoid Jack like usual. While in normal, I could cheese it and run from Jack, hiding becomes so much more important due to his increased damage. Okay, time for the garage fight. Just gotta pick up the car key and... Huh. In a devious twist, you must now find a lockpick to open the box that holds the key. In the main hall, things start getting really different. There are now three of those cages that take antique coins. Two of them feature new attack and defense bonuses, but the third has the scorpion key in it, which was originally in the basement. If you have enough antique coins to unlock the scorpion key right away, you can use the key to bypass this shadow puzzle, quickly get to the next save room, and get the shotgun early. But on the other hand, you don't actually need the key to progress, and I wanted to save my coins, so let's go upstairs. Where's Martin Leeson? Oh, right. Remember how Jack shoots himself and then dramatically reveals he's still alive in the bathroom? That doesn't happen here. He shows up pretty much right away and pursues you more aggressively. Uh, uh, ah! You know what, screw it, let's just, uh, let's try the key. Aw, oh, shoot. Uh, come on, come on. Okay, just gotta run to the save room and- And there's the next big change. Enemy placement has moved and later game enemies now show up right away. This makes the basement trek terrifying all over again, as you never know what will pop up and when. Fighting the Molded is tough since they now soak up way more bullets. I wasted all of my ammo on just two of them, although this does make getting that critical headshot all the more satisfying. However, the game actually balances this increased difficulty out really well, as the basement has fewer enemies than it did on normal. The basement is also where I put the saving system through its paces. I found that you were given just enough cassettes to feel like you can waste one or two if you need to, but not so many that it removes the stress of choosing to save. If you play smart, it won't lead to frustration. You should always save in a new slot though, just in case you need to reload. 
Item placement has changed as well. There are more coins to make up for the extra cages, but their locations are moved around. Major items like repair kits and even some weapons have been moved and made available earlier. Basic items like ammo boxes have fewer bullets, and you'll find far more separating gel instead of chem fluid. This means you'll have to make tough choices, like sacrificing bullets so you can create medicine. And this is when it clicked for me that Madhouse isn't some brutal difficulty designed to be punishing and harder, but instead changes up the way you play Resident Evil 7. Enemy encounters are less frequent, but much harder. Later game enemies show up earlier, but so do advanced weapons. Limited saves add stress, but you can manage that stress by saving strategically. I also understand now why Madhouse is unlocked after you play through the game once. The foreknowledge of upcoming events like bosses is important in helping you decide when to use a save, but at the same time this knowledge is also used against you as the game plays with your expectations in smaller ways like enemy placement, so it can surprise and scare you all over again. So if you feel the desire to start playing Resident Evil 7 again like I did, give Madhouse a try. It does a great job making the experience feel new again. Plus, beating it unlocks infinite ammo, which makes for some wonderful catharsis. I love talking about both Resident Evil 7 and games that have cool alternate modes, so if you want to see more videos like this, make sure to like it and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Also, if you want to see more Resident Evil 7 videos, I put one out about what it's like to play the whole game in VR, so check that out. Thanks for watching.